and he will conclude with his own research on biohijacking the biosynthesis processes for his own purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, the words of both Arabic will be transcribed into images by the artist Henrik Schutzen, and the words of both Arabic will be followed by a performance of the trio Kalk, composed of San Pedro, Christian Tenbeck, and Oliver Lama, playing improvised jazz. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the for that absolutely the most unusual presentation ever. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me here to, to Copenhagen. And uh, for a while the storm looked bad, but it worked out. So, today we will talk about evil chemistry. The dark side of chemistry. And we start right here <coughs> with this spider. And now we all think this is a horrible, venomous spider, but no, not at all. This is a normal garden spider. And in my story, this spider is actually the victim. And this story begins right after World War II. A young professor, Hans Peters, he survived the war, and he was given the task to build up the zoological institution in the University of Tübingen in Germany. He did research on spiders, and he wanted to know exactly how a spider spins their webs. But there's only one problem, and we need to turn off the light, since spiders only spin their webs in the middle of the night, preferably between 2 and 4 in the morning. And now you can get a beautiful spider web. <coughs> Unfortunately, Professor Peters, he was a very tired person. And he didn't like to stay up all night. So he asked a colleague, Peter Witt, at the department close by in pharmacology, hey, uh, Professor Witt, can you, can you give a spider something uh, to shear them up a little bit so they, they spin their webs in, in, in daytime instead? Sure. <laughs> it's quite easy to give spiders drugs. As long as you put it in, in, in a little drop of water with some sugar in, the spiders will love it. So they tried a lot of things, for, for example, uh, marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't go that well. The spiders did not change their time schedule. They, they remembered, they, they didn't do anything right apart from the time. So yes, in the middle of the night, and look at this web. 
I mean, you will not collect many flies from this web, do you? <laughs> so, Professor Peters, he kind of lost his interest. He just wanted the spider to stay up daytime. But his colleague, he did it. He found this very interesting. So he continued to give drugs to spiders. Here's another one. Uh, LSD. <laughs> It's a fantastic web, isn't it? I mean, the spider spent hours, hours on making the most perfect web in the world. And it looked like this. Fantastic. But the worst web of them all, look at this. This was the worst drug ever. A spider actually got coffee. So, in the world of spiders, I guess coffee will be a highly regulated drug, while LSD might be okay. And this tells us something, how incredibly difficult it is to find out if a compound is evil or not, isn't it? So this lecture is about evil chemistry, the dark side. Let us take another example. Wait, we take this one, nitroglycerin. It's obviously a dangerous chemical. Don't try this at home. You, you can explode things. But we need it to build roads, construct things, of course. And, I mean, obviously, this, this actually gives some of the money for a Nobel Prize too. And it's a good thing. And what is less well known is that this is actually a drug for Anjana. And the most famous person using this drug was actually this guy, Alfred Nobel. A little bit ironical, isn't it? So, nitroglycerin is, of course, a dangerous chemical. You can blow things away with it. But it's also a drug. And it's also useful. So, we can't say that chemistry, for example, or even science, can be bad or evil. But, of course, there's a dark side. And this lecture is about the dark side. And why? Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> so, let's take a look. Yeah, I have to give you a crash course in chemistry, okay? It's very, very simple. We have four elements. That's a bunch of other elements, but they are more or less useless. I'm organic chemist, so I need some carbon, I need some hydrogen, some oxygen, nitrogen, that might end up some sulfur and maybe, maybe, maybe some chloride too, okay? That's it. You don't need to know more chemistry. And with these very few elements, you can build beautiful molecules. This is one example. This is dopamine, one of the most important neurotransmitters in the brain. And uh, this is, of course, a beautiful picture, but it's a little bit too complicated. So let's make it easy. <laughs> and now you all get a little bit stressed. Now it looks like it looked like in the chemistry books. <laughs> and uh, I, I help you a little bit. Look, look, we, we remove the hydrogens. So whoop, away with those. We can just calculate how many hydrogens there should be. And you know what? We take the carbons too. Okay. So this looks much better. This is a skeleton formula. This is the working tool for organic chemists. It's just a picture, and every, every angle, that's a carbon atom. And then you add, just add in other stuff around here, and you just calculate how many hydrogens. What's the use of this one? Do you need to know a lot of chemistry to, to, to appreciate this lecture? No, not at all. But this picture is quite easy to grasp. I mean, you can compare different chemicals with each other. And usually, if the compounds look like each other, they usually behave in a similar way. And that, that's, that's my, my profession. I, I kind of look at molecules and say, yeah, this is a, a neurotransmitter, or this will smell bad, or something like that. I would try to, to show you a little bit of my world. We need one more, uh, more uh, knowledge. We need to know a little bit about molecular properties. <coughs> so in order for a molecule to have properties, you must have a handle. So this is the most boring compound in the universe. It's methane, natural gas. It's absolutely no handle, and it doesn't smell anything. It doesn't taste anything. You can't see it. If I add in a lot of methane here, you, you can't even sense it. You have no sense for methane. It would just be like air. The only cool thing you can do, you can actually burn it. OK, that's good. Now, if you now take that hydrogen and just put in an oxygen here, like that, now we have something completely different. 
This is methanol, wood spirit. It's toxic. Just that little change. It's a liquid, it smells a little bit like ethanol, and it's toxic. Meaning that if you drink this one, your body will recognize it, transform it into something even more toxic, and it might even kill you. We get back to that. <coughs> if you now take that oxygen and exchange it for sulfur, that will be a compound you will all recognize. It smells horrible. That little change, and now it's horrible. Something like rotten egg. Okay? And if I just put one drop here, we can't be here until tomorrow. It will smell so bad, and you need such a minute amount to just fill the whole area with this stench. Now we're ready. Now we can talk about evil chemistry. Okay? So, for example, we can talk a little bit about smell. This is a compound called scatol. Scato, Greek meaning shit. <laughs> this molecule smells like shit. But, interestingly, you need a certain concentration for it to smell really bad. If you lower the concentration, it will change smell and be flower. And now, this is a cool part, this is, is a very common ingredient in perfumes. In minute amounts. We can talk about explosions, this is TNT. I will not talk about explosions in this lecture. You can talk, this is my favorite topic, chemical pain. And I show you soon, since I love food, and this is very important, not that compound, this is mustard gas, but other similar compounds that, that causing pain are interesting in food. This is an example, it's mescaline, a drug. And finally here we have a nerve gas, a typical poison. So my lecture, we start here. <coughs> I will start with poisons. And I will show you why compounds are dangerous for us. And then, at the second part of the lecture, I will turn into our warning systems. Smell and pain. That will warn us of dangerous compounds. Okay? Good. Let's start here with poisons. Here's a collection of uh, poison labels. The top one, you might not recognize it here, is the double mercury sign. It's a Swedish, old Swedish pharmaceutical sign saying very poisonous. This one, the skull, appeared in North America in, in the 1850s. This one, the black skull here, is from the 50s. I found it in one of our old chemical storage rooms. This one, the orange skull, was, was uh, used until a few years ago. And today, it will be this one with a red uh, diamond with a skull in. But what, what's this here? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is Mr. Yak. <laughs> so in North America, they found out that this one, the old skull, really didn't work well on kids. <laughs> they said like, oh, pirates. I love pirates. I want to drink this. <laughs> Not good. So they changed into this one, which, which really can be misused. I mean, it's yeah, Mr. Yeah. So it works pretty well. So in order to talk about poisons, we need to, to, to meet this man. <laughs> Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus from Hohenheim. <laughs> One of the most impressive names in the known universe. He, he didn't even like it much. He changed his name into Paracelsus, which means better than Celsus, but was the main medicinal guy. So um, he got obviously a very good self-confidence. <laughs> he, he also got the world's first double exam in medicine and chemistry. And I mean, he lived in, in the 1500s. And he knew a lot about chemistry and medicine. And he said this, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the do's permits it to be not poisonous, or poisonous. Meaning that every single chemical around you can actually kill you. Or you can take any poison you like, just if it's a small enough amount, and it will not kill you. Even water, even water can kill you. Why? So it's quite easy. Your kidneys can only produce about one tablespoon of urine each minute. If you drink more water than that, meaning about a liter water each hour, 
you build up water in your body. And if you don't go to the toilet, you will get too much water. Sounds better. What will happen is that your cells will actually swell. And the first thing you recognize is that you actually get a headache, since the your, your brain is actually swelling, but you have a skull that kind of puts it back, and it will turn off the blood to your, your, your brain. What happened a couple of years ago was that an American radio station had a completely idiotic com competition. <laughs> Doomed we for a wee. So the contestants should drink water, quite a lot of water, and um, in radio. And uh, the one that, that didn't go to a toilet for the longest time kind of won a, a Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Strange, mother of three, attended this, this competition. She uh, continued drinking water and uh, she actually came on second position. She drank about five liters of water, ran out, kind of puked a lot, went home and died. So, Little dose of water, about six liters, in a reasonable amount of time. We're actually kidding. Don't drink too much water. Beer is much better. <laughs> so, in order to be more toxic than water, meaning virtually all compounds, you need to get, get specificity. For example, ethanol. If you drink 700 grams of ethanol, you will die. There's absolutely no chance of surviving. You can die with much lower amounts, but 700 grams will definitely kill you pure alcohol. So why? Why? Let's, let's take a look into our brain again. And uh, we take an electron microscopy picture. And here, here's a brain cell, right here. We enlarge that one. It looks like this. You have a cell body and you have this long axone going down to another nerve cell, a brain cell down here. And the signal between the nerve cells is electric. So you, you basically start a signal, da, 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 and it goes down through this one, down here. So this is more or less like an electric cord. And like any electric cord here, it must be isolated, okay? With plastic, or in this case, myelin sheath, fatty compounds, but wrapped around the nerve to keep the electricity in, okay? So uh, if, if you take a look at this, this, this is fat meaning that fatty compounds can actually dissolve into this one. For example, ethanol. And when that happened with your cocktail, you will be slightly slower. Okay, slightly slower. If you drink a lot, you will be slower and slower. <laughs> Other compounds, this, this is chloroform and ether, old, old used use for, for um, keeping patients asleep. They, they, they work in the same way. They dissolve into myelin sheath and makes you slower. Very dangerous though, so it's very difficult, to, very complicated to get the dose right. And today, we use this one, sevofluoron. It's, it's a compound that's designed to go pass into your nerve cells and pass out again. You can put you sleep and wake up. But the picture is even more complicated, since down here, here's the interesting part. I'm a chemist. This is the interesting part. I don't like electricity. Here, here you have chemical signals, OK? So if we enlarge that part, it looks like this. This is a synapse. Synaptic cleft here. Here's one nerve. Here's another one. Uh, here's some, some neurotransmitters, signal substances. This one is called gamma amino butyric acid. No one dares to say it. It's called GABA, OK? And you have some chloride ions. And here, the blue thing here is a receptor, something that gets chemical information. So when you do something, for example, feed, about anything, okay? Think about anything. Now, this happens. Look, here comes the electric signal. It starts, you, you put the, these, uh, these neurotransmitters down here to the synaptic cliff, cliff. They exit, they are transferred here, bind to the receptor, first one, a second one here. Now it opens up an ion gate, ion channel, and the chloride ion goes in and uh, the signal is transferred. Complicated. Yeah. So every time you think about anything, this happens. Okay? Good. Now, we enlarge that one. It looks like this. Here's GABA. So when GABA binds here, it opens up the channel. Now we can use our new chemical knowledge. Look, 
This compound. It looks quite similar, doesn't it? Look, there's this group here, a couple of carbons, an amino group, an OH group. Okay, that's fine. It's good enough. This one fits here too. So if you get that compound, you will pass out. This is GHB, the day trade drug. It doesn't smell anything, doesn't taste anything, and at least in the UK, there's been quite quite a lot of cases when, when people pour that into a drink, and you pass out. So what was alcohol got to do with this? Yeah, here, yeah, the red one, this alcohol. So ethanol. It also binds to the GABA receptor, and when it does, it makes the binding easier for GABA. So this 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 makes the effect bigger. Here, here's another one. That's that's uh, tranquilizers, by acetone, volume. And this is the reason why it's so dangerous to drink alcohol and take tranquilizers at the same time, since they just turn off your brain, and, and what happens is the brain turns off the, the breathing and you die. Here's another one here. That's the old barbiturates, old sleeping pills. A little bit too dangerous, so they do, don't use them today. Okay. So it, it is a complicated picture, but I tell you, it gets even more complicated. Since if you, for any reason, got some alcohol in your body, of course, it shows an unspecific action on your nerves. It does though show this specific activity on your GABA receptors, but it's also metabolized in your body. The body doesn't like alcohol. You do, but your body doesn't. So here comes ethanol, and we have absolutely no use of ethanol. So it tries to transform this into something better, like this. So an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase transforms into acetaldehyde, and this is a toxic compound. This is a hangover. <laughs> so if you just want a hangover, just start drinking that one instead of that one. <laughs> Fortunately, our body has another enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase that actually transforms into acetic acid, and that's fine. We, can, we know what to do with acetic acid. Okay. It lowers the pH a little bit, which makes you even worse in the morning the next day. So, but that's the guy that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. If you find this, this nice mushroom in your garden, don't eat it, really. <laughs> it's called common ink cap, black swamp in Swedish. It's got a poison in called coprin, and coprin will actually cut out that one. Meaning that all alcohol end up here. So for a couple of days, almost a week, if you eat this, this mushroom, you can't drink any alcohol. Not even the, the light, light, light beer. Don't even try to wash your mouth with Listerine or something. The alcohol in it will make you puke. So, I mean, be on the safe side. Don't eat that one. Okay. So if you're unfortunate to drink <laughs> methanol instead, this would be really bad, since it fits into the same system. And what will happen? It will be transformed into formaldehyde, which is used to preserve biological specimens and embalm bodies. And the problem is you have a lot of this enzyme in your eyes, meaning that you will form a lot of this guy in your eyes and you get blind. That's the reason why you get blind when you, if you drink water alcohol. It even gets worse, since when it's transferred, it's transferred into formic acid, which is the same thing but, but ants produce to keep guys away. And this is a strong acid, okay? Meaning that if th this one can lower the pH in, you, in your blood so much so you die. So people drinking methanol, about 25% die, 25% are blind, and usually about 50% survive, especially if you drink a lot of other ethanol. Since it, the system actually likes ethanol better than methanol. So this is a very, very toxic compound. Now we're going to turn into something much more toxic. Okay, you ready? Coffee. <laughs> so both coffee and tea contain caffeine. There's no tea or something like that. Caffeine in both. Uh, a cup of coffee about 100 milligrams. A cup of tea about 50 milligrams. Green tea slightly less, about 30 milligrams. Coca-Cola, about 20 to 30 milligrams. Uh, what happens is that caffeine blocks another kind of a receptor called adenosine receptors. And these are the receptors that keep you awake. So it kind of blocks those. 
So, so meaning that, that or which must keep us away. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> the adenosine receptor kind of makes us sleep, and this one blocks it, meaning we stay awake. But we will not be full of energy, as you know. You will just be awake. You can be tired and awake if you drink enough coffee. Unfortunately, it also blocks, or it actually enhances muscle contraction, smooth muscle, which makes you can get a diarrhea or too much coffee. And even worse, if you get poisoned enough, it can actually stop your heart. It just vibrates like it like, doesn't really work well. And for this to happen, you must drink something close to, I mean, 10 grams of caffeine. As long as you stay below 500 milligrams a day, it's fine. But 10 grams, that's quite a lot. You have to drink about 100 cups of coffee, and then you have definitely other problems, I promise. <laughs> So far, I've only talked about normal things, water and alcohol and coffee. Let's turn to the bad guys in the chemical food, cyanide. This is the famous, one of the most famous poisons out there. And it's actually, okay, it's dangerous, it is. But you know, when you see it in the movies, someone takes the cyanide and like, yes, die. That will not happen. So this, this is usually potassium cyanide, and it goes into your stomach, there it goes with acid and produces hydrogen cyanide. And this takes about 20 minutes, but that doesn't go well on, in, in the TV, so yeah, 20 seconds, that's good enough, okay. So what happens here is that the hydrogen cyanide inhibit uh, an, an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase, which actually helps you use the oxygen. So you can't use the oxygen anymore if you, if you get this drug. So you die from asphyxiation. Lethal dose of this one would be about 300 milligrams. That's not a lot. That's a small spoon. And of course, this is one of the favorites for uh, crime literature. This is one of the more famous, sparkling cyanide. No idea what the title is in Danish. But uh, cyanide and champagne or something, it will be in Sweden. Most famous order ever, Agatha Christie. She's here. Her first book is not about another poison, strychnine. This was actually a bet with her older sister Marge. Her older sister said, oh, you can never ever write a story about a crime that can't be solved on the last page. Oh, I can, she said. And she actually used to be a pharmacist during World War I, so she knew a lot about dangerous compounds. And her first book was about strychnine. It's a very odd poison, since uh, it blocks glycine receptors, which are inhibitory, it kind of lowers the activity. And in small doses, this has been used as a tonic to, to get nice and cheerful, and in larger amounts, it gives horrible muscle cramps, and the body goes up something like this, which looks very good on TV, <laughs> and of course can be lethal. And, and uh, this book was about how to misuse a tonic. Lethal dose of that one, 150 milligrams. Now it's small amounts. Are you ready to meet the most toxic compound known in the world? Good, okay. Yeah. Here we are, botulinum toxin. It's a huge protein. You see every little blue dot here is a nitrogen, every little red dot is an oxygen. Here's a sulfur, okay? So this is the most toxic compound. Botulus means sausage in Latin. And it was found first in a special kind of German bloody sausage in the 1800s. And it's formed by bacteria in the sausage. And if you eat it, you get paralyzed. And very, very odd. You can paralyze the muscles. You, you even stop the earwax production. It's, it just stops everything in the body. So uh, a very, very strong nerve poison. And a little dose of that one will be one thousandth of a milligram. You need a microscope to see that. How? How can it be so incredibly toxic? Now we must talk a little bit about nerve poisons. So here, here's, here's our favorite nerve again, and here's the muscle. 
and here it's connected, the nerve is connected to the muscle. We send in an electric signal again. So, and here, here's another kind of synapse. It looks pretty same like the other one, but the green dot is now this one, acetylcholine. That is the signal substance used for almost all muscles. And this, mu this, this receptor down here is the favorite in nature to use as a target for poisons. So, uh, for example, nicotine actually activates the receptor, which is as bad as a block. It means you, you, you can't stop. The muscles are just cramping, which actually can kill you if you take enough of it. Here's another one. This is a huge protein again, just in another kind of form. It's called alpha bungaro toxin. It's from this snake. A banded crate. Very poisonous snake, venomous snake in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, in my story this time, it starts uh, on, on uh, September 11th, 2001, in the morning. And the, this snake scientist, Jules Lubinsky, he'd been catching snakes in Burma for a couple of weeks. Anyone collecting snakes? No? What you do, you go out in the forest in the middle of the night and collect snakes in, in bags, cotton bags, and then next morning you, you, you kind of write what you think it is, and then next morning you take them up and just take a look. And he got a bag, it says, very harmless snake, or something like that. And it turned out to be one of those banded crates, a small one. It's very difficult to say, but this is, this is horrible snake. So, and he got bitten. He waited, he'd been bitten several times before, so he wasn't too worried about it. Now it was a tingling <coughs> sensation in his finger, and it worked its way up the arm. So the muscles got paralyzed. And when it reached his lungs, he couldn't breathe. This was right out in the middle of the jungle. So his colleagues starting with CPR and continued for 24 hours. And he was awake all the time. He could even for a rough time write with his other hand, saying, blue harder. Please. <laughs> this is a true story, and it's quite horrible. Unfortunately, he, he didn't get any help, so, so he passed away. The only way to actually survive a snake like this is to, to be flown into hospital and, and use a, a medical ventilator until the poison is broken down in your bodies. It takes a couple of days. If you survive, you will be fine, but very, very weak for a couple of days. Here's another one. Sudden nerve gas, nerve poison. This one blocks an enzyme that's supposed to be there to cut away the neurotransmitter. So the signal never stops. You get cramps again. And these are the nerve agents produced by Germany during World War II. Fortunately, they didn't know. They thought the, the Americans had produced them for a while, but they hadn't. So they didn't use it for that reason. Unfortunately, this one was used in a terror attack. Almost on a day, tomorrow, in Tokyo, 1995, 12 dead, a couple of thousand wounded, but much less than it could have been, since the Japanese government really got it fast and could actually save a lot of people. Kasumi Gaseki, that's the that's railway station, or the, the, the metro station, closest to the, the governmental part of Tokyo. Now we're ready. Now we can talk about botulinum toxin, the most toxic compound in the world. It blocks the release of acetylcholine. There will be no acetylcholine in the muscles. And of course, you will be paralyzed. And as I said, everything, even your earwax. So what do you use that for? Little dose, 1,000 of a milligram. Yes, why don't we inject it in our forehead? <laughs> This is Botox, used in the beauty industry. What it does, it paralyzes your muscles up here and all the wrinkles disappear. Fantastic idea, isn't it? <laughs> so is it dangerous? No, not really. They use quite a small dose. And uh, as long as you inject it in the muscle, it's fine. If you inject it in, in, in your bloodstream, you're, you're going to paralyze half of your face. Don't try to do them, okay? Good. So, let's conclude. Poisons are obviously not very good for us. Fortunately, there are warning systems. 
Not for, for snakes, of course. But your bodies have excellent warning systems for poisons. It's called your senses. And, for example, smell is a warning system for poisons. Your taste, you have some tastes, yeah, like sweet and umami, that, that's just for good, good things. But, for example, salt is there to, to, to keep a good level of salt. Not too much, not too little. Sour taste is to keep you away from, from bad food. Same thing with bitter taste. This is an indicator of poisons. I came back to that one. And you have a lot of other senses. You have a special sense for carbonated beverages. A very weird sense. You have another one for pungency, mustard, for example. I came back to that one. You have a one for, for hot, like spicy food, which is actually a warning system for heat. You have another one, a warning system for cooled. And you also have a warning system for astringency. Things that kind of deposit proteins in your mouth. Let's talk a little bit about talk a little bit about smell. <laughs> so you have your notes, okay? Right here is something called the olfactory epithelium. It's about the size of a stamp, a normal postage stamp. A dog, the similar area would be about the size of a normal towel. This is the difference between our sense of smell and the dog. So here, it, in, in an electron microscope picture, it looked like this. It looked like octopus here, with arms. And if you take a cartoon of this, it will look something like this. So here are the, the octopus, and these are nerves going into your brain. So your sense of smell is the only sense in your body where your brain communicates with the surrounding immediately, directly, without any, anything. Okay? That's the reason why you can get so much emotions from smell. It communicates with your brain immediately. If you take a look here, we have olfactory cells. And if you enlarge a little bit down here, it will look like this. And these are the receptors for smell. There are about 350 different. This one might recognize this molecule, which is probably fruity. This one will recognize this one, which is more more, more um, flowery, I would say. And this is important. In order to smell a compound, it must be volatile. It must leave the surface. So, for example, this is, is correct from a chemical point of view. Money doesn't smell. It can smell. This is metal. It boils at 1500 degrees. There would not be any metal molecules out here. And then you stop me. But, hey, Paul, they do smell. And that's correct. Take a coin, wrap it, smell, it smells metal. You know what it is? The fat on your hand will get oxidized by air. And the metal will catalyze this transformation into this molecule. It will smell like metal. So when you do this, you smell oxidized fat from you and everyone else that <laughs> used this coin. <laughs> Here's another one, dead fish don't smell good. The reason is this molecule, trimethylamine. So what do we do, at least in Sweden and Denmark? We take this smell fish and we add some acetic acid on it. We pickle it. <laughs> Which is not for it to taste good, it's to not taste too bad. <laughs> you remove this. this. This one smells bad, but this is a salt, so it's not volatile anymore. So the reason is just to, just to, to get it. So if you want to try the fish out, just add some base in it, but smell horrible again, okay? <laughs> so how do our system recognize molecules? This is a cool part. So uh, you take a molecule, you take a receptor, it looks like a puzzle, it put into this one, and it fits <coughs> snugly into our receptor. Good. This is a molecule called hyacinth. It smells of hyacinths. Here's another one. So, okay, mm, it also fits good. This is benzyl acetate. It smells of jasmine. Now you wonder, okay, these are obviously flowery compounds, but 
How can we recognize between hyacinth and jasmine? And we all can. They fit into the same receptor. Yeah, this is core part of a small system. There are more receptors. So this one, hyacinthine, might fit well into this one. Good. And benzyl acetate would not. So that receptor says, charpray, oh yeah, it's flower. This one says, oh, it's hyacinth, not just me. And if you um, transform it into reality, it looks like this. The blue thing is the protein, this is a crystal structure, and here is a molecule that smells something probably bad. And if you do things like this, you will get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's pretty cool, 2004 in medicine. And what Richard Axel and Linda Bach found out, what was our sense of smell is combinatorial. So for example, if you have a, a bunch of receptors here, if you take these five, it will smell gross. If you take these, it will be a tulip. And if you take five completely different ones, it will be a tomato or something else. So, meaning that this combinatorial way says that you might be able to differentiate between 100 million different smells. How many can you differentiate between? I would say less than 10,000. And this is what makes it so incredibly complicated to, for example, taste wines. It's very difficult to remember different smells, not to sense them. Good. Now, here's the chemical relation again. Look. This is called a benzene ring. Benzene ring, oxygen. Benzene ring, oxygen. Benzene ring, oxygen. Flower. If we remove the oxygen, we add in some nitrogen, you get burnt flavors. Popcorn, peanuts, fresh bread. You might think it's a little bit scary. Oh, this smells like bread. No, 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 no. This, this is fresh bread. This molecule is actually formed when you put the dough into the oven. It is fresh bread. Here are some of my favorites. These are, are more like smoked, like a kipper, or my, my favorite whiskey. So, and now we can just continue. And for example, if you add in sulfur, it usually smells very bad, like this one. The scent of a skunk, or not really scent. Let's try another one, this one. This is my favorite, asparagusic acid. So, I think you, you can all do a very interesting experiment. Go home, take some green asparagus, smell it, doesn't smell too much, boil it. What happens is you form these molecules that smells very good. Now do the experiment, eat asparagus. Wait two hours and go to the bathroom. And this happens. And now at the bathroom, one of two things might happen. For 60% of you, you will find a very peculiar smell. Asparagusic urine. For 40% of it, nothing. You all produce this one, but 40% of you are anosmic. You have a blindness to these compounds. You can't smell them. And we all have these anosmias, but we share different ones. Meaning that you and I, we will all smell the same thing in different ways. Meaning that I like some food, you like some other food, okay? That's the reason, anosmias. Here's another smelly compound, garlic. Nothing, you cut it, you form my food. So, you form this one, but it got a wonderful scent of garlic. And if you Wait a while, it forms this one and gives you a bad breath next day. <laughs> you can't get rid of it. It's in your sweat and your lungs. You can do whatever you like, brush your teeth a thousand times. You will still smell bad, okay? <laughs> if you now take an onion, you see, it's only that double bond that moves one step. It will be completely different chemistry. When you cut it, you will cry. And then the next day you will smell bad, but not as bad as that one. So, why do you cry? The reason is that this one will interact with your warning system. Making you cry. This is a dangerous molecule. It can hurt your DNA. Don't eat too much. Your body tells you. Be aware. Here's some other guys. Here's mustard. And also rocket salad and horseradish. They all share this one. Which is a similar compound. Take another one. Cinnamon. If you chew on, on this one, you get a very, very burning sensation. These big red chewing gums will give you the same sensa sensation. 
And also, if you put your head in the smoke, you will cry. And this is this molecule called acroline. And what they share, and I'm going to teach you a new word, they are electrophiles. They are longing for electrons. And we don't have many electrophiles in our bodies. We have the opposite, nucleophiles. Meaning that these will interact with your DNA, protein, and hurt you. So we must have a warning system. And we do. It's two parts. This is the defense system. It's called glutathione. It contains a big sulfur atom here. And sulfur is the perfect nucleophile. So here we are, sulfur. That one will try to destroy electrophiles that enter your bodies. But we don't have enough of this one. So we must know if there are electrophiles around. And here comes the coolest thing in your body, the TRPA1 system. It's a warning system. It looks like this. Complicated picture. This is the system. Here's the cell wall in a cell. We remove the cell layers. We take the, the receptor and we kind of enlarge it a little bit. Thanks. So this is a, an ion channel. You will soon see what it is here. Here's the ion channel. Pretty cool. And down here, if we separate that part, so and enlarge it a little bit. So come on. Good. So, and some 3D effects. Here we are. Look, here, here's a sulfur atom. And any electrophile that fits into this pocket reacts with that sulfur atom. Open the ion channel and send a warning signal saying, pain, pain, pain. If you want to try it, just take a big tablespoon of, of, of Dijon mustard, put it in your mouth, and you see your TRPA system in, in action. You will cry. So, here's another one. What's that? No, 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 it's not. It's horse radish and green uh, food coloring. So, this is wasabi. There's no wasabi in Europe, okay? So, uh, this is, this is an, an, a root. It only grows in like mountain streams in Japan. You take it, you grind it, and you have to eat it in 15 minutes. And it's gone. It's not worth the trip to Tokyo, but if you're there, it's, it's good. So it's very similar to horseradish, but if you add in this one, this gives a, a slightly more complex flavor. Another system again. If you eat bitter almonds, you will get hydrocyanide, not good, and this electrophile, and it will warn you again. Just give it a try. Take a peach, a soft thing in the middle, cut it, and you'll, you see cyanide and some electrophiles. Two more warning systems. This is one for heat. The body must keep control of heat. So the TRP V1 system says it's hot, 43 degrees. Some compounds interact with this system and lower the threshold. So if you eat chili, you will think it's more than 43 degrees in your mouth and you will get this hot sensation. If you take this one, cuts it into half, and take that one, it will be the hot compound in ginger. Not as hot in here, but still hot. <coughs> and here's another one, black pepper. Finally, toxic compounds are usually bitter. <coughs> they taste bitter. So this is another warning system, there's so many abbreviations. This is called the T2R system. We have about 30 different T2R receptors, and they warn us for, for bitter compounds and says bitter. So, for example, coffee, beer, or why not, tonic. They all contain bitter tasting compounds, very diverse structures. Or sometimes some people like it. Why? Why do we like it? For example, this wormwood, which this is quite a famous Danish drink, I heard. It's very bitter, but why do we like it? Yeah, we want to be a little bit on the wild side. <laughs> it's a little bit like climbing mountains. We want adventure, but we don't want to die. So instead we drink like camel dance. <laughs> and our system says, yeah, I'm so wild, I'm using this bitter compound. And it keeps us a little bit happy. And why not? It's quite safe. So now we turn the, the page around completely. There's a bright side to this poison. 
sometimes the toxic compounds can actually help us. This is mustard gas. One of the more horrible compounds man have ever created. It gives horrible inflammations. Usually don't kill you, but gives very bad wounds. If you take this one and you add in a metal group here and change it into a nitrogen, you get this one, which is actually one of the better cancer drugs. And we learned it from mustard gas. And here's another one. If you go to Australia or the Pacific on a vacation and you find one of these snails, don't pick it up. This is actually a carnivorous snail. It feeds on fish. And now you wonder how on earth can this snail catch fish? Yeah, it got a harpoon filled with poison called coonotoxins. About 100 different ones. And each coonotoxin can pinpoint one T type of nerve in your body. This, these guys are the painkillers of tomorrow. You just find out what kind of nerve hurt you. And you take the right coonotoxin, there are about 10,000 different ones all together in the world, to, to uh, give it a try. Fantastic. So, this is what I do. I do not work with poisons. I might be an evil chemist, but, but I'm really into cancer drugs. My research, I try to cure cancer or understand cancer cells. But it is the same knowledge. If I understand molecular properties, I can understand cancer better. And for example, toxicology, which we've been talking about today, pharmacology and organic chemistry, it's all about chemistry. And it can really be quite interesting. And this is an advertisement. This is a book uh, two years ago, Evil Chemistry. And this book will come out in August. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Evil chemistry? Or evil chemists?